let's just start at the very beginning. How did you get into freestyle skiing? I know that you got in through dance and gymnastics, but is that kind of the normal route to get into to freestyle? No, it's not. I was kind of like one of the first athletes to kind of come into the program so late. So I was 14 um, when I switched across. Um, but I did have to bring my skills of gymnastics across. I had skied with my family since I was three years old. Um, but most people started mogul skiing when they're like eight. Um, and so they've been training for a long time before me. So I had a lot of catch up to do. Um, but I just kind of love the sport um, through like this school ski competition we do. So you can try all these different events. And so I did all the skiing and cross country events at it. It's called Interschool. Um, and moguls was the most interesting to me and it's, it's a baby course for sure um, compared to what we see on at world cup um, but it gives you a taste of it and lets you know whether you like it or not and so i like that there's bumps there's jumps and then there's speed so if one thing's not working for you on one day you can still work on something else like you don't have to just keep drilling in the same skill but um, there's so many different components um, to work on so it's kind of nice variety and it's also kind of a little bit crazy I mean if you guys are watching the Winter Olympics at the moment most of those sports are pretty crazy um, but I like that adrenaline rush yeah I was actually talking to my parents a couple of days ago we were watching the the Olympics and I was just thinking the the athletes that are in the Winter Olympics seem like considerably more adrenaline junkie minded than those in the summer Olympics. Would you agree? Yeah, I think so. I mean, a, a lot of it is that we're depending on the external environment. So that can change so much. Um, but you hear a lot on like the commentary that they, they crashed out and what a disappointment rather than in the summer Olympics, you don't really hear that because there's not that risk reward, I don't think. So it's, yeah, they performed or they didn't. But for us, it's like, oh, they went so big and they crashed out so close. It's like, oh. <laughs> How does that impact the way that you perceive success and failure when you, there it really isn't a middle ground. You either complete the course or you, you crash. Yeah, I mean, that can be really difficult um, because you're like, if I only just did this one thing or if I only was, just one second earlier, that whole run would have been different. Um, but that's kind of the exciting thing of my rule thing is that nobody really does a perfect run and it is a judge sport. So sometimes you can make a mistake and the judges will take like nothing from you. And sometimes you can make a mistake and they'll hugely like deduct you and you're like, what? Like it wasn't that bad. So that can be really frustrating. I think is when you've got like, it's in the hand of the judges. Um, but that our job is to make it as seamless as possible, um, to make it look as easy as possible to the normal eye. And hopefully the judges, um, you can, I mean, sometimes you'll make a, a mistake in the top. And so you feel the need to, you know, wow them the rest. And then maybe they'll forget at the top, at the, the mistake at the top. And sometimes that does happen. Like you just got to go for it. So that's a bit of like a tactical play, um, but it also makes it really exciting. Because there, you're always changing things really on the fly, it seems. How does that change what happens a minute or half an hour before when you're kind of mentally mentally preparing for that competition? Um, well, yeah, we change courses every week when we're on World Cup. And so in training, there's a lot of tactics and a lot of work into which line's going to fit your style the most. And if you're having issues with jumps coming out right or left, maybe you'll change lines. But the half an hour into it is just you're trusting in your training and you'll know that your body will make that instinct change because when you're competing, if you're concentrating and trying to force these changes and make sure you do the right thing, that's when you come into more trouble than good. So it's letting your body do its thing at that point. I mean, you can talk and discuss possible tactics like going a little further right on a jump um, might be something you are going to focus on, but it's never going to be like a technique thing. It's that you just want to be active and fast and ready. So you need to be focused in the zone so that your body can do its thing as quick as possible, because it's all about recovering from mistakes as quick as possible rather than avoiding mistakes. If that makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely. What kind of conversations are in that mental checklist ahead of time? I mean, you, you talked about tactically, but talk kind of within yourself. What are you thinking? Um, I mean, for myself, going through so many 
injuries recently, a lot of it is confidence building, um, trusting in myself and trusting that I am strong and can do this. Um, so it's a lot of like positive reinforcement back to me. Um, I do have a few keywords. I like to talk through the run where I'll have, usually I'll focus it into three parts. So there's the top, middle, the bottom, and there's two jumps. So just like one or two focus points for each of those things. And then it's just like positive things. Like I'm strong, I, I'm capable, I'm gonna do this. So um, yeah, I don't think I did that so much previously, but definitely with injuries, it's been like forget the injury and focus on how strong you are now and that you can do it. And we'll, we'll talk through those injuries mm. because wow. <laughs> But let's let's back up about a decade and work through you realizing that moguls was what you wanted to do, what you were best suited at. I mean, did yeah. someone tell you that? Was it a personal mm. feeling that this was like exactly where you wanted to be? Uh, yeah, no, I, I told my mom that I wanted to do it um, after that school ski competition. Um, and mom said, you can join like the local program, Parish of Winter Sports Club, if um, you do a 360 today, because my brother was trying to teach me them all winter and I was like, wouldn't do it. Like I get like 270, like nearly all the way around. And so Josh and I went out, my brother, and hiked a jump a few times until I did it. And then I was allowed to sign up for the program the next year. Um, and then the rest kind of sailed pretty quickly because like I said, I was pretty late to the sport, but I was really athletic. And so then I was on the radar of the mogul um, world and they pulled me in pretty quick. Now there's different programs that we do pull people from into schools to bring them on to like a junior comp and um, the national team guys usually coach them. So the kids get a feel for what it's like in the community. Um, and then we try and poach them from there. But uh, I was pre that age and kind of just, I'd met some of the kids in the, um, in the ski area and it's gone up and spoken to them they're on like the trampoline mucking around um and I just thought they were really cool too so I wanted to hang out with them how did team Australia find you um well it would have been that first year when I signed up to the program I mean so Australia being quite a not <laughs> it's a summer country we don't have that huge of a program right like we've got three main programs for um winter sports so it's pretty easy to find who is in moguls um, and it's very niche. And then there's like, uh, we've got our junior competitions, which we only have two a year. And we have our um, Continental Cup, which is another three competitions. So it's pretty easy to narrow down people from that competition. And from there, well, it was my second year. I was kind of poached um, from them watching me train and compete. And then what kind of sports psych resources does Team Australia have for skiers or winter Olympians? Um, so we have, so you can either be in NSWIS or the Olympic Winter Institute, and they're kind of like the two programs you'll fall under. And there's usually a psych for either one, a sports psych. Um, I didn't ever use the sports psych at NSWIS. Um, it wasn't very helpful for me. Um, and then into 2018, we had a sports psych on the road with us. Um, and he was with the Olympic Winter Institute. So I was considered a very low priority on that because I was at the bottom of the rung. So I'd get um, help at the very end if he had time kind of thing. Um, but I was in kind of crisis mode at that point where I was um, suffering with anxiety and panic attacks. So I wasn't really getting sports psych, I would say. I was getting clinical psych. Um, and he had that background, thankfully. Um, so it was mainly giving me grounding techniques at the top of the course when I'd go into panic and to be able to bring me back in to actually make me perform. But he's not, his role was not to ensure that I had good mental health. It was to ensure that I competed. So his role was to get me out there competing. So he did that role, but he didn't extend past that. So that mental health issue still kept happening for me um, I was able to compete and get through but I couldn't continue like that so that's when I had to take time away from sport um, and I just never I mean previous to that it's just interesting because we get taught these skills from a psychologist or whatever it might be in a room and like 
here's some mental skills on how to focus, how to concentrate, very sport specific things to succeed because all they care about is Olympic medals, right? It's not about your wellness per se. And then they're like, okay, and then go take it out into your field. And so I just find that really difficult to do and something that needs to change because how can you sit down in a room with someone and say, it's like saying, you know, you need to get your quads bigger to um, be able to ski faster. And we're just going to sit here and talk about mobile skiing for two hours. And then you're going to go out there with no coaching, no help and do it. And I just, and no progression. And I just like, don't, is a bit of disconnect there on how to deal with pressure and stress just by sitting in a classroom. Um, and there's no like crossover. So that's something in the space that needs a little bit more work, I think, in the Australian programs in particular. Um, so that when you get to the point where you might come anxious or you might come into this panic, you, you already have some skills and some coping mechanisms where you've practiced in the gym with your heart rate up here to be able to level it back down and control and be able to refocus again rather than just telling you that you should focus. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that is a disconnect and you're the first one who has ever kind of verbalized that, especially from a, a country level. I mean, I mean that's, yeah. that's interesting. I, cause I just started to work with someone in this last year that brought in the two, like we were in the gym, like we did sit in a room and we talked about skills, but we went into the gym and he put me under pressure physically and then would make and then make me bring back down using those skills that we talked about to focus and to concentrate. So we'd use heart rate, HRV, um, blaze pods um, to bring back in that focus element whilst I was already in stress in the gym. So that was really interesting um, exercise for me to go through. And I was like, whoa, why has nobody ever done this with me before? But that's kind of some of the perks I got to training outside of the system is that I got to pick my own team and pick who I wanted to work with and I got to find some really awesome people so some wins some losers <laughs> so at 16 you were already getting a ton of looks and then six months later you tear your ACL yeah um it's a bit of a bummer my start to the uh mobile program wasn't great so yeah I was picked at 15 to go overseas on like a development camp. And then I guess they're just testing you out, see how you go overseas, training in that environment. And then I came home and um, tore my ACL. And then uh, I re oh, well, I tore the opposite one within a year and a half. So I just returned to competition and I tore the other one. Um, so I mean, they say it's genetic as well. So maybe I just had the gene and I just had to get it out of the way. But that was really tough because I just joined a sport and I'd just been injured for nearly four years because it takes about like a good two years, I reckon, to get back to where you were. Um, and it's a good 12 months off snow each one. So it's like it's a long time out for something that I had just begun and I didn't really know if I was any good at and it also being shafted to the side because, you know, I was new to the program and they brought me on board, but then they saw I got injured so they're like, see you later. Um, so to be then discarded and then I was getting old in that system to be 18 and be injured is old. So I knew I had a lot of hard work ahead of me and whether that was something I wanted to do, I didn't really know at the time. Um, but I was like, I'm going to do the rehab. I'll make sure that I'm good. Um, and I had people around me that were like, just do it. And then at the end of the six months, we'll see, like, do you want to come back? We'll be here for you. Um, obviously outside the program at that time, but there was other coaches that are willing to support me. So yeah, I, I was pretty demotivated at that second one. The first one I was like, oh, well, I'm in high school. I can go to school with crutches. People will give me attention. But the second one, I deferred uni to go and ski for the year. I was meant to go to junior world. Um, so like things were just starting to pick up for me. And I was like, yeah, like finally getting to the sport, getting somewhere. Um, and to do that second one, I was like, oh, maybe, maybe I'm not made for this. 
two knee reconstructions by age 18 is quite a story. What, what kind of mental toll did that have on you going forward in your sport? Because you were just saying you didn't even know you were, if you were good at this. Yeah, I think it was just like, you had to really break it down into the small things. And that's what I tell a lot of people that do their ACLs, because particularly girls in our sport, we do it a bit younger and the boys are a little bit older. Um, and so it can be really heartbreaking to do your ACL around 16, 18, 20. Um, and it's just kind of, sometimes it's like at crunch time, you got to pick, do you want to go to university? Do you want to um, go into this elite athlete path? And so if you're injured, it's really easy to take the other route out and, you know, hang out with friends, go to parties, go to uni, um, go to college. Like it's, it's just really easy out at that point. Um, so I mean, I just like really focused in on the little things. So, you know, for your ACL, like you have to learn to walk again. So like the first step is, can you straighten your legs? So once you get, you like, so I wrote like tick list because I'd already done one. So I knew the second of what I was going to be achieving. So like getting a straight leg, being able to walk on it without crutches, um, being able to do a step up. Then it's like moving on to hopping, being able to run again. Um, And it's like all these little things so that, it doesn't seem like it's 12 months away that you're going to be skiing, but it's, oh, it's within this week, I'm going to achieve these three things. Um, because if you are focusing on that end goal, like anything, like in sport, if you're just focusing on the Olympics, it, it's going to be impossible. Like you just can't. You have to focus on all the small process steps to be able to get to that end goal. Um, and if you're focusing on those little things, then you'll also find the little wins. And so then you'll see the positivity and you'll be able to keep moving forward because you'll, you'll feel satisfaction as you go along. How close were you to hanging it all up and saying, this is just not worth it? Uh, I would say the first three months of that second surgery, I was pretty, I'm not doing this. Um, (laughs) So I think there was, yeah, three months there where I was just like, oh, no way but I was that that first three months like you're still learning to walk and everything so I was like I've got to do the rehab to be able to walk and I'm an athlete person I want to be able to play sports so yeah I was just kind of doing it because I knew me as a person really wanted to stay sporty but I didn't really see myself going back into moguls at that time it just seemed too far away and and that I wasn't good enough like I just kept getting injured (laughs) so what at that point what was your goal I mean obviously to walk again, but did you have a goal in mind when you had made it, made it up in your, in your head that you were not quitting the sport, you were just working to get to a place where you could not only walk again, but also try and see if this is still a sport that you like. I mean, what was that goal that you got to and said, okay, now I'm back. Um, I think once I started moving properly and was like jumping around and everything and I was still pretty heavily like related with all the skiers so seeing them go on camps and everything and the biggest driver for me from all my injuries was that I didn't feel like I'd achieved what I could um, and I still had more in the tank and to show the world like we're all performers like we want to show the world what we're capable of Um, and so that was like a big thing I was like I think I'm still pretty good at this and each time I learned a lot about myself and my body um, and I also got a lot better um, because they could retrain you and re-ski you the way that they want you to be and your body to be so um, doing two in a row kind of sucks but um, I developed a lot as a skier and as like an athlete and so I was a lot stronger and fitter and so I knew that I could be better than what I was previously and then 2018 you started having some struggles I mean what did that what did those stem from um I think it was this um, pressure to perform um I related my whole identity around skiing and the result of skiing um because we put a lot on hold in our life to be an athlete and I get um that what we do is pretty amazing get to travel the world and see amazing things and but I think people also don't see how hard we work in between that and the sacrifices that we make um because if it was easy everyone would do it right um 
and I had given up uni that year to focus just on skiing um, and we were traveling a lot and there was eight girls fighting for four spots so it was very competitive that year um, and it was very cutthroat like if you didn't beat someone you would cut off it didn't really matter if you were last and second last it just mattered that you beat your teammate so there's a lot of tension in our team because of that structure as well because it's all about beating your roommate which is just unhealthy it wasn't about doing a good performance it didn't matter it's just whether you beat the person you're sleeping next to, which is a really difficult environment to be in. And then because I didn't have anything else going on, like it was ski, 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 ski. And I come home and like on my other camps, you'd have to, you know, do an assignment here and do like this uni class here. So it just breaks it away and changes it for a second and also makes you realise there is a world outside of sport um, and that you do have a life out, like on the other side of sport too. But when you're just in it, you're like sucked into this bubble. And, and because you're putting so much time and energy into it, you want to see success and performance out of it. Like you want to see a reward out of, out of all your hard work. And so I put a lot of pressure on myself to achieve. And so at the beginning of the season, I was training really well and would compete not very well. So not crash out, but just stiff and tight because I was, like I said before, like, trying so hard not to make mistakes and to do this perfect run that I wasn't flowing down the hill and you can see that and you can see this stiff movement um, and it just looks uncomfortable and unnatural and it's just not going to score well at the end of the day like you got to let your body do its thing and then my results just slowly kept dropping and my anxiety and poor mental health just kept increasing because I was like I'm not getting what I want to achieve and I'm trying harder and it's not happening because in reverse I needed to try less and my results would go up because I had the skill I just couldn't put it down um so yeah it was a really tough tough space because you just you've got to be like okay let it go and you just can't easily let let that go when you care so much <laughs> did you ever talk to your your roommates and your teammates about the process and how cutthroat it was and see if they were having the same mental struggles that you were competing against you? Um, I mean, my roommate itself, we were in a good position where we qualified the year before. Um, so we didn't really have to worry too much. It was more that we felt the pressure from other people. Um, and it just, my friendships with those people kind of disintegrated that year. Um, as me and this other girl started to achieve and other people didn't, it was very much segregated. Um, and it's very hard to, I mean, you can try and be supportive, but people are mad at you. They've got to blame other people. Or, and so it's really hard to be supportive in that environment, especially when you feel like you can't have your own success either. Like I felt like some people were, it's, it's, like I'm having a bad day it's all about me it's like well actually I made finals and I'm really happy but we can't be happy because you're sad and so that's a really hard dynamic to be in because people are allowed to be happy for their successes but we also should be understanding and caring for people when they don't have success um but yeah I think everyone was struggling and I just don't think it was handled very well from the top down unfortunately and we were just doing what we could to cope and to get the results we were hoping for but yeah just a sticky situation <laughs> it sounds like it yeah let's let's work back a little bit to qualifying for the Olympics mm -hmm. when did you know that you were going and what was the reaction um, so we don't qualify until after the very last event, which is usually two weeks before the game. So um, you have to be in the top 30 in the world and then you have to be in the top four in Australia. And so um, I had gotten a top 10 the year previous. And so the qualification is a two year process. And so that top 10 is what carried me through into the Olympics because it's your one best result because Australia wants to see the best possible chance at a medal. They don't want the most consistent skier. They want uh, someone that is most likely to get the best result. Um, and so that's why they wait until the very last comp because it's only your one best result. So anyone can get it till the very end. Um, 
And so I found out two weeks before and as I mentioned, that season was going worse and worse for me. Um, I actually didn't want to compete in that fast competition. I told the sports psych, like, I can't do it. Like my mental, like I'm at my, I'm, at, I'm full. Like I can't go through another competition, another heartbreak again, because I just kept getting worse and worse. And I just didn't want to go through that stress again and going through all that panic and everything to then get a result that I didn't even want. But because I think I didn't even want to compete in it, I actually did pretty well at it. I was, I was at the point where I'm just like, I don't even care. <laughs> like, and so I skied pretty well at that comp. Um, but yeah, I found out that afternoon. I mean, you know, but you don't get the official invite until a few days later. And it was just like a sense of relief, I guess. Um, we were very excited, me and my roommate. Um, but obviously there was a bunch of girls that didn't qualify. So it was an awkward, you know, situation, but they got sent home straight away and we got to go to Olympic camp. And so um, that pre-Olympic camp is where I skied really well again because that pressure and that stress had gone because I'd qualified. I did, you know, that big, huge goal that I'd focused so much on. Um, I'd gotten to the games like I didn't have any pressure on what I wanted to get the games I guess I just like it was a big focus to get to the game so I guess that's where I lost myself in that that goal and that sport and so once I achieved that I could relax and I could train and ski really well so that pre-olympic camp is where I gained a lot of confidence again um, to set me up well into 2018. I mean qualifying for the olympics is a huge moment in your skiing career what did that symbolize for you especially coming back from from two ACL tears <laughs> yeah I mean I think the it was just like a lot of relief for that hard work and even though I wasn't in the greatest position that I could still achieve good things in a compromised position um, and that instills a lot of confidence in yourself because obviously in like any part of daily life like you're going to have struggles you're going to have problems but you need to know that you can cope and get through and still you know do the job or achieve different things um or just function as a human you know when you're under this stress and pressure um so that was like a good thing for myself to realize and then at the games itself I think when I uh we have like an induction ceremony with Australia and we had to stand up on the, on the stage and they played the national anthem. And that was kind of like a point for me where I realised like the significance of the games and the significance of me representing my country. Um, so I've never heard the anthem like I'd heard it there before, where I was like, holy crap, like I'm representing Australia and this is a big, big deal. Um, so that kind of was like the thinking point where I was like, you know, like, this is this is the O show and this is a big time. So that was kind of like a cool moment, but also like a, a stressful moment. <laughs> and then you ended up getting 20th in the moguls. Mm -hmm. How did you feel about that? So um so I got to I got to make an extra final, which was top 20. I I was aiming for the top 12 final. Um but I had improved every day with my skiing. I had, we'd made a tactical change to take my jump on the bottom slightly left. And I was doing a little bit more and more. And then on the last one, I did it too much. So I overcorrected too much. And so I drifted out of the line and I got 20. So, I mean, it is, that's kind of mogul skiing, but you have, to, you have to go after it and you have to make changes. You can't do the same run that got you the a lower score before. So I'm happy that I still went for that change and went after I skied faster I skied better um but yeah it just wasn't quite the setup that I was hoping for into the game like I was hoping to keep building like I had the year before and get more finals and get more confidence in that um higher range um because like we all kind of have this capability to be able to put down these runs but you can see the excellent performers and the excellent competitors um and they can have not as good technique, but it's just how well they compose themselves and how well they um, believe and are confident in their skills and just go after it on every competition. And that's just something that I never really got to that season, um, which I wish that I could have built on, but 
um, it's still, I knew, I was still very proud of what I did at that game. Um, it wasn't the experience I was hoping for. So I've said previously that I didn't enjoy the Olympic Games and that kind of can ruffle some feathers because I think everyone, even if they do or don't do well or have a good time or not have a good time because it's, there's so much like oomph around it. Everyone feels this pressure to say it was amazing. It was awesome. I just like, I got to represent my country and it was so cool. And, but like, it wasn't that experience for me. And so I just felt like I had to, you know, say it, but um, yeah, it's an interesting one because I'm still really proud of what I did and really enjoy. Well, I take a lot from that experience, but I didn't really have a good time. <laughs> understandably yeah when you're in a sport that is so unpredictable how do you build self-confidence I mean it's just in training I guess um we train we're on the road pretty much nine months a year even more training um and um just building on these skills and building on different conditions particularly so going overseas for us is huge and the biggest difference between us and like Americans and Europeans is that they have a lot of competition. So they just learn to compete from a young age. Like every weekend, like if you're in the Rockies, it's Rocky Mountain competition every weekend, back to back. And then on Jules Day, they, they duel till the very end. So they duel for like eighth, ninth position. And I'm like, rather than that World Cup, that doesn't happen. Like first, second, third, that's it. <laughs> um, so they just get that experience from a young age on competing. Whether you do well, you don't, you get up, you do it again and you put runs down. And so that's something that we miss in Australia is that because we have such a short season, we don't have that field of skiers. So there's just no demand. And so we didn't really have that program to go over and get all this competition experience. So that's something that they've changed now where they take younger kids over and they do get that competition experience. And so that I think, will build a lot of confidence in the young developing guys to come through the program because otherwise you're thrown into NORAM, which is a level below World Cup, and you might just get smoked there. And so you're like, oh, well, I'm coming like 40th, 60th, you know, <laughs> not very good for the confidence either. But yeah, just practice training a lot, um, train different skills, train different conditions um, so that you are adaptable. Um, because we do ski so many different mountains, so many different countries where the snow conditions are so different, the courses are made different. And then obviously the weather comes into effect. You need to be able to ski in rain, in um, like snowstorms with the wind, um, and then also sun. Like we can't all be fair weather skiers, unfortunately. So that comes down to training and training through that so that you, when you get to competition, you know you've already done it and you know you can handle it and you just make that quick quick change on the spot and you're back in back in the zone back focus and then in the time between when you left in 2018 and when you were preparing for 2022 how much of that was actually skiing and how much of it was a mix of mental preparation and just general training mm, so I had an interesting one after 2018 so after 2018 uh, I tried to come back for training I took a little time off and then I realized I just wasn't in the right headspace because I'd been pushing for so long and I could finally let myself relax a little because I'd made that end goal. Uh, so I actually took, um, I think it was about nine months away from competitive sport um, to focus on my mental health. So I saw a clinical psych at that point externally um, because the Australian team did not provide any support in that area. Um, so they agreed that, um, I needed to work on this area um, that I need to take time off. I went to them saying, I think, I think I'm not okay. Like, I think I need really need help. And they said, we agree. We, we didn't want you to keep pushing right now. Um, we want you to work on your mental health and come back to us um, when you're fit um, next year. And if you're fit and healthy, then we'll, we'll re-support you then. Um, but they don't have any clinical psych support in the program. So I had to go and fund that myself. And I stayed with our sports psych and employed him privately because if any people have gone to psychologists, it's really hard to start again, um, to explain everything from the beginning, to go back and dredge the past to, to make sense of what's happening right now. And that's an intimidating process for one. 
Um, but also finding the right person is, is another intimidating process. So I just didn't want to have to go through all that. Um, so I kept on this um, sports psych um, and we worked together for quite some time um, because I, you know, attached myself to this identity as Maddie as a skier. And so I had to find myself again. And then I had to find my, the love for the sport again because I'd lost that in all this competition pressure. Um, so I did go over and I skied with like a um, Wasatch in um, in Utah, like just a local team. And I just kind of found the love by being around young skiers again, really, because they just love the sport so much. They do it because, you know, that's their passion rather than when you go at the high level and you're training with these people, it's their job. It's like you're out there to achieve a goal every day. So just training with different people in a different environment was um refreshing I guess um and I realized I and I didn't want to you know not do any moguls that year so I I trained with them for three weeks um and I also wanted to do a new trick a back full um and I wanted to compete that because I didn't know if that would give me the closure and the satisfaction that I was done because I didn't get that chance into the games because they were like no we're going to do the run you know that you're good at we don't want to ruffle any feathers right now um which I understand but also that was one of my goals so I wanted to achieve that um and then I went free skiing with my family around France which was bougie and delightful um so I found the love again and I was like I did that back full in competition and um I was like oh I kind of like this still um and so I came back um to the team and said I I want to come back to training with you guys um, I just want a progressive return to the team environment because I found that team environment really quite stressful because um, we live and we travel on the road on top of each other and like the camps, it's like all in, one in. And so like you would with a physical injury, you get a progressive return. And so I asked for that for a mental injury. So I said, can I come on the camp maybe for two weeks instead of four weeks? Can I stay separately just to have my own space? Just because I was worried about my mental health affecting other people because you're you're in a house with people and I was also worried about that stress adding to that um mental health um because you know mental health is not just solved overnight and I think that's where they thought I was either I was either good or I wasn't I had to say like are you good or are you not like was like the question and I got told at one point when I said I didn't want to live I was like can I live separately they told me, well, no, you just have to suck it up and get over it at some point. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I don't think you can tell someone with mental health problems to suck it up, which I think is the whole problem with mental health in sport is that we're taught and we're trained from a very young age to be strong, to push through at any cost. And if you don't, you're not going to succeed and you're weak. And that crosses over to the mental space where you have to keep pushing, um, otherwise you won't get success and we'll, we'll drop you, you know, because you're not strong enough to handle it. Not that you don't have the skills to cope and we're going to help develop you in this area. Like if you don't have the skills to do a backflip, we'll go on the trampoline with you and we'll help you learn to do a backflip. But in the mental space, you're considered weak and not strong enough. And so that became a real issue and I was fighting quite hard for that like to be understood in that area and for them to have more education and understanding and I asked the sports psych to help me um, convey these messages to the coaches and he was actually the one who told me to to get over it at some point I have to get over it and so I had no support on the inside either helping me to educate the coaches on what is appropriate for me to return to snow or not and so that's where I think a lot of this um, tension happened between me and the coaches. And then um, subsequently I was dropped from the team. They didn't reinstate my scholarship and they uh, left me kind of for dead, I feel like. So I've had issues since then with getting any support or any opportunities to um, train or compete um, because I'm external in the system. And so they say that because you're not a supported athlete, you um you don't you're not uh able to get these services but I still qualified for a world cup so I was a world cup athlete without any access to support so I was at the highest level 
And I think I was that year at nationals, I was third at the Continental Cup, second ranked Australian. So I don't know, it was not to do anything with my results. It was to do completely with either the fact that I had mental health problems or the fact that I, I really honed in on getting support for it. And they didn't like that I was so pushy or what I had to say about it. I'm not sure. And, but I feel like I've been punished for that decision or that set of events since then. Um, so that's affected my training a lot for sure, because, you know, I had put my identity so much into this skiing and felt like that I hadn't achieved what I wanted to and felt undervalued. And then they confirmed it by saying, you're not good enough. You don't deserve this. And then on a daily, daily rate, I was, getting reinforced this by saying no you don't get access to the gym no you can't go when they're going so it's just constantly saying no you're not good enough no you don't deserve that um and this is why and so that's a mental battle in itself constantly being like no actually I am good enough I do deserve to be here I should keep going and I should keep trying um so that's when I developed my own amazing system around me um which consisted mainly of my brother he's my full-time coach um, but I also got new physios in I got new sports psych and a new um, clinical psych so I created my own team but I still had struggles continuously because to be training around people that make you feel awful is just really hard work and on good days like you can forget that you're like I'm training like a superstar I'm going to come and crush it at competition don't even worry about them but on the bad days it's very easy to focus in and blame someone else or um you know, blame the situation and that can be ad like adhering to your performance. So I spent so long trying to, you know, focus on the things that would help me as a successful athlete. And that is not going to be on their decisions and how they make me feel. It's going to be how we're going to problem solve that. How am I still going to be ready and be in the fit and fighting condition? Like who do I need to speak to to get access to this? And who do I need in my team to make sure that I can succeed? So I was just in problem solve go 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 mode um so coming to the other side of that now I mean I think we'll talk about that later is like oh like it's, it's a lot to then like be relaxed from because you know that big come down from pushing and trying so hard and pushing away that stuff that isn't helpful now you know I have the time to buy into it and it's just upsetting so it's not very nice um but I think I got a little sidetracked there. <laughs> no, I was I was going to welcome the tangent. Um, but yeah, and then I did my third ACL. So then I had some more time off snow, um, which I decided not to get reconstructed because I'd already had the year off and I felt like two years was like crazy to have off. And I also had pressure from the governing body that you need to perform on World Cup this year. Otherwise, you're not going to get another spot. Um so I had that pressure to come back and I also just didn't think I could go through that that 12 month process of having another surgery and being out for that long um, when I'd already just had the previous nine months off um, so I went the uh, conservative route and that's when I came into a lot of trouble with my knee but I was on snow a lot of that time from then on minus COVID um, so because I was a non- scholarship athlete during COVID a lot of those guys got to train because they were allowed to train in the um in the institute program facilities um but because I was not I was not given that exemption so I was not able to train through that period um so that was really difficult um but then I was allowed to go overseas and train so I stayed over there for some quite some time in uh, 2019-2020 and then this last year I went over in August because Australia went into lockdown and we couldn't train here. And I was like, well, overseas, they're letting you do what you want at your own risk. So I'm going to go over there. So me and my brother were on the road for over six months, just chasing training opportunities wherever we could get them. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that it's a really interesting topic to touch on. How would you define someone who's mentally tough? What aspects of them yeah. would stick out to you and say to your brain that person is has has mental toughness? Yeah, I find that 
even the term mental toughness hard to use because I consider myself as a really tough person and a really like strong resilient person but I wasn't mentally tough in the point that it mattered um and so I think I don't like to use that term <laughs> because it just it just sounds like grit and true like parents to be able to like move forward no matter what. And that like strong, I just think of like a strong bodybuilder that can lift as much weight as possible, which in our sport and in many sports, it's not how much weight you can lift. It's the finesse and it's how well you do it. And it's a skill. And so I think now what I value in my own mental health, I will, I will go with that rather than mental toughness is like, your ability to be able to cope because we're all going to have difficult situations and it's not ignoring it and it's not pushing those feelings to the side and pushing on like we get taught it's being able to actually um buy into these emotions and you know work through the pain and through bad times and be able to come out on the other side stronger and have grown so it's the ability to make change and use any opportunity as an opportunity to grow as a person is what I think is someone that is got good mental health or good mental skills um, so that we don't think that, you know, we don't think that, oh, why is this happening to me? You know, that story or oh, poor me. It's actually from this situation, I'm going to develop these skills and I'm going to become a better person and a better athlete. Um, and I'll be stronger and better on the other side of it, even though it was a crappy situation, but now I'm, I'm up here. So it's that ability to reframe things, to be able to notice when you need change and you need to grow and also just that growth. Yeah, I think one of the very first episodes I did of this podcast, there was a huge emphasis on redefining what mental toughness meant. And I've, I've kind of made it a priority to ask all of the rest of my guests, how would you define mental toughness? Because everyone is, everyone's giving me a different answer. And I think it's, I think it's intriguing to, to look at all these athletes and varying degrees of their sport, varying success rates, varying stories of success and failure and ask them, what, what's it like? Because everyone's given me a different answer. And I think it's, I think it's fascinating. It's one of my favorite <laughs> questions of, ever, of anyone's experience because everyone has different experiences then that they translate into, okay, well, this was a period of time where I was mentally tough or something was lacking conversely. Like for you, you had a, an extended period of time where you, it seemed, it seems like you had to be tough for yourself because no one else was supporting you. Yeah, difficult space to be in elite sport. I think it can be very isolating and very lonely, especially being an individual sport. I found that like I worked a little bit with my sports science with team sports. And even if you don't have that support staff around you, you have your team and your team, it values because obviously you're as good as your worst player. So they bring everyone out, but being the individual sport, it's everyone for themselves and it's very lonely. I mean, at the moment there's the tennis going on and it's talking about how lonely it is to be out there on the court for two, four hours or whatever. And just being by yourself, thank God we've only got 30 seconds. Um, but uh, it's just, it's, it's a hard place to be um, successful at the top or at the bottom, but just in elite sport where there's just so much focus on medals at the Olympic games and at all costs. What is the career length of a freestyle skier? And do they leave because of injury or do they leave because they age out? What is the most common exit? Um, I would say it's around 30. It's probably, so I'm 28 and I'm, I'm considered old in mobile skiing. Um, I think at the Olympics, the oldest girl, I think was 33 and the oldest male was 35 possibly this one just gone um and like we call them papa like because they're old like you know at 35 you're papa um but yeah it's because of the impact on your body I mean mobile skiing is not very nice on the on the body like we do have a lot of injuries and it's just 
constant repetitive impact, which is going to lead to stress fractures, it's going to lead to ACLs um, and a lot of like degeneration over time. So people just get sore and you don't recover very quickly. So then you're sore for competition. So it's really hard to train at, at that level if um, your body just doesn't recover. So you see a lot of the athletes, particularly this year, were stepping it back in training for World Cup, um, only doing one or two runs to check out the course and then building into the competition, obviously, to be able to ski at that level. But previously, like when I was 20, like I was skiing eight runs in training. <laughs> I would never do that now. So it's adapting as you go along. But yeah, your body just can't take that load, take those hits anymore. I mean, people can take a little time out for those top guys. I think after this game, like lots of people take the year out and they'll just be on the trampoline, like low impact things, not on snow so much. Um, and then they can pick it up again into the next game if they want to push again while they're older. But um, yeah, my body's not going to do that. <laughs> can you work me through your injuries and tell me approximately what year they were? I have three ACLs in a fractured back. Am I yeah. missing anything else? Um, I had stress fractures as well in my lower back, um, which caused me some grief when I was at 16. I don't actually know if they're from gymnastics or from skiing, um, could have been from both. And then I also had like a neck disc issue. So into 2018, so about 2017, I had all this disc stuff. I had a crash to my shoulders, which really initiated it. I like balked a backflip and landed like, and um, yeah, I used to, we called it crazy girl symptoms because I get all these autonomic symptoms. Um, and I just couldn't emotionally control anything. I get these crazy headaches, but I just cry. And I'd be so tired. So I just have to like go to bed for two days kind of thing. It was weird. And nothing made it better. It was just like slowly over time, it got less worse, but like very, very tiny things I didn't even notice. I was like, it's just not getting any better. But now, now I haven't had any of those symptoms for a very long time. But yeah, at the time I was like, this is never going to go away. But it wasn't enough to be like, you can't ski. It was just like, sometimes I was just, I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. <laughs> How recently was that third ACL? Uh, I did it in August 2018. So I've been skiing on it for two years. That seems, seems like a big issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I had to change a lot to be able to ski without, without an ACL. And so I think that's like my biggest feat now coming away from sport is that I did kind of nearly the impossible like there's a few other athletes that have done it, um, but you you sign up knowing that you're going to have battles because you've got this a little bit of instability. So when you're coming down from a backflip and your my biggest problem was backflip and then it going a little back seat and then my tibia going into my ski boot with that extra bit of pressure um, and I'd get pain on the outside and um, it would swell up. So it'd be between two days and two weeks where I'd have to take off. Um, and so that was recurrent and it was just tough because to get the same injury over and over is really frustrating when you're trying to make change and you're trying to, um, do all these things with your body. And so I don't think I could have done anything different. Like looking back now, like I put everything into it. I possibly could. I found a new physio in San Diego and I like lived there at one point to get all I could from him and my body has never been in such peak physical condition. It's just that I'm missing this key little ACL. So it's gonna slide around and it's gonna swell. But I don't have any issues doing any other sport, any other skiing, like I ski without knee brace. It's only at that top 5% when I'm pushing myself in the moguls and particularly in competition because you're pushing yourself that next level again is when I come into trouble. And so that was really tough this year and I missed more than half the qualifiers. And then I, when I had gone into the qualifier, cause they're weekends, they're back to back. So, you know, I'd hurt myself and then I'd have to recover and then I'd have to compete again. And to compete after just going through that, the previous five days or whatever, it's very fresh in your mind. And it was really frustrating because not because I was injured, but because I'd worked so hard 
to not be injured and I knew what I was capable of and in training I was excellent and I knew I was in peak physical condition and to get into the gate underprepared was heartbreaking it wasn't the performance and it wasn't the fact that like I was so proud of how resilient and how hard I pushed and that I was able to get back out there continuously right to the very end but to be there in under peak condition is is heartbreaking because you know you've got so much more to offer and like I said we're performers like you want to show the world what you're capable of and I underperformed but I also achieved something crazy and being able to ski at that level and be able to be resilient and determined outside the system with no ACL with no support is just you know I got to give myself credit for that too (laughs) yeah (laughs) and I I also saw that you were the second woman in Australia to to perform a backflip with a full twist on snow yeah that was back in 2018 so oh I would have done it before then but that's when I competed it so that was my gymnastics background jumping's always been my strong suit um I love to go big and I love to wow the judges in that aspect you know how we confuse them sometimes my skiing wasn't as good um and I'm not I'm not scared like I'm pretty gutsy and I think that's what also led to me skiing without an ACL is that I'm gutsy like I'm not scared of the consequences I'll go and do it and I'll trust in my body and I like to ski fast and I was sometimes a little bit wild because I was you know a little bit out of control but I could control my slips excellently and so I could also do back pulls quite well and so I took them to snow that was a big goal and then I also took it to competition because that was a huge goal for me. And then when you didn't qualify for 2022 how did that prepare you for life past your sport I mean had you Uh, already started unassociating yourself with that athletic identity at that point well I that was like the end point for me anyway whether I qualified or not I was always going to retire um so that didn't change anything it just was sad not to finish on a high note and also not to get another opportunity to ski well because I'd gone back to training I knew I'd qualified the I've qualified the spot so I was training really well again like I said into 2018 I was training excellently in steamboat again I was like a little bit gutsy I was going bigger I was skiing faster I was ready like I was like if I get this opportunity I'm not going to fuck it up like I'm going to go out there and I'm going to go for it you know um and that was the mentality I was in like And so it was disappointing not to get that opportunity again. Um, So, I mean, it was only two weeks ago. So it's still very fresh in terms of me processing that and really understanding that scenario and that situation, Um, because I still feel like I deserve to go. Um, Things that either athlete was injured. And so there's always these ifs and buts and what's and you know, could have, should have, would have, but I'm trying to focus on what I did achieve in, in getting and being able to get that qualifying score to qualify for the Olympics. And so I did that. I did everything that I could possibly do within my control and everything else was out of my control. And unfortunately those decisions out of my control have affected the way I see and have affected the opportunities. And so now it's easier to, to really hone in on those things because I don't, like I said, I don't have to protect myself for the better of my training because that's over. So it's really hard not to rethink all those decisions and think, you know, if I got that and why did I get treated that way? And would this have come out differently if I had had these experiences and these opportunities? Um, And yeah, trying to steer away from that because that's not going to be really helpful for me processing and moving on and then to be able to let go and move on to whatever's next for me is is what's important now but obviously I have to you know give myself the space to be upset because you know it is upsetting not to achieve your goal and it is upsetting to not get like all this love and support from you know the organizations from Australia for a very long time um and that can affect me as a person it definitely did to think that I wasn't valued and respected as an athlete in their system is, is upsetting and it's hurtful. And, but, you know, you can't get your value from other people. You can't depend on what other people think of you because really you can't change that. So it's just what you think of you. So 
yeah, trying to focus back in on that and the good people around me and what I did achieve rather than the decisions of other people because can't change that. <laughs> so your priority now is slowing down the process. Mm. What do you put at the forefront of getting that done? Well, that's really difficult. So I <laughs> found because we are such structured athletes. Every hour of my day was planned out and everything had a purpose like down to what I eat what I work where I walked where I went like it's just everything was so purposeful to now have no real purpose is really difficult but I don't want to jump into something and jump into another role just to fill that void because I know in a month or two I'm going to come out burnt out because I haven't had time to have that come down and have this process over you know, this very stressful last four years and last six months. Um, so finding that balance between having a little bit of purpose in my day, but not filling it with another full-time job or another role where I'm like, okay, got to get up, got to go, got to gotta do this, got to do that. Like I need to actually relax and de-stress, but I'm finding that very difficult to do. So yeah, still working on that, trying to give myself, daily kind of structure but when I don't have anything to do and I've got I'm lining up I've got a few job interviews here there and I've got a bit of part-time work here there um but that doesn't really give me that much structure and like I went to the gym the other day and I stood there and I was like well I don't know what I'm going to do because I have nothing to train for so what do I do <laughs> so an exercise has been such a really important part of my life for quite some time and then it's not that I'm lazy I was just like everything I've done has a purpose. Like I do an exercise for a reason. So why would I just do exercise for no reason? <laughs> yeah. It's interesting that you say that the, the episode that just came out yesterday of this podcast was a, a swimmer from Team Zimbabwe. And he was talking about how swimming, although you can get really good at it and go to the Olympics with it, you can also do it for the rest of your life. But it's a very different type of swimming. You know, so he was training so hard for the Olympics. And then suddenly once the Olympics were over, he was like, okay, well now I, I'm done with this sport competitively. So now I can just, mm -hmm. what am I swimming for though? Yeah. I mean, do you, do you kind of feel that the same way? Yeah. I mean, I think it's more like, what are, what am I planning and doing with my day that's making this you know achieve some long-term goal like we're so goal-driven we're so like determined the reason why we're successful as athletes are because of those reasons and because of that discipline and structure and now I don't have that so it's a weird space to be in but yeah I'm trying to have fun I did I went water skiing last weekend and to do a sport for fun again like I was just giggling out the back there because I think this is such a strange feeling to do something for fun again um because obviously what I do is really fun still like I still enjoy skiing but you know there was so much you got a goal-oriented training where this was just like I was like whoa <laughs> what is this probably look like a hooligan out the back of the boat just giggling away um but yeah it's it's an odd 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 feeling I can tell you that <laughs> and then kind of going off of that do you watch the Winter Olympics I mean, yes, I did. How does that make you feel to know kind of like an insider's perspective on the process? Um, I mean, you feel for a lot of these athletes, particularly, like I said, like these winter ones, like people are crashing out and bombing out and they've trained so hard and they're not getting what they achieved, uh, what they were hoping to achieve. Um, but like a lot of these people, because the winter sport community is a lot smaller, they're a lot of my close friends. So, you know, I'm still cheering on, supporting a lot of these people. And I really want to see their success. Like I can be happy for other people while still being sad that I'm not there, you know. Um, and a lot of these, even other sports, what they do is crazy. I find it baffling. So I think it's really cool to watch. And because you've got like a slight insight onto how crazy that might actually be and how hard that skill is um you know how hard they're pushing there so you've got a lot of respect for what these other sports do um and so you know I just want to cheer everyone on but it is hard it was definitely hard to watch the moguls event 
um, to watch the others surely not compete and to be chosen over someone injured is heartbreaking. Um, but I don't know the full story. I don't think everyone, anyone ever will know what happened behind but closed doors. But, you know, just being isolated by the Australians and this being the final straw, it's just going to leave a bit of taste in my mouth for a very long time. <laughs> Moving away from from your experience, good, bad, ugly, otherwise, with with skiing, you are back teaching gymnastics. Yeah. How did you know that? <laughs> did I know that? <laughs> how how does it feel to kind of reconnect with one of the first loves of your life? I've been coaching gymnastics for quite some time. Um, so I've been doing it since I finished high school. So I think, yeah, 10 years now. Um, but it is nice to be valued by people um, is my biggest thing. Like I've just been isolated and been lonely and pushed to the side a lot. And I know that the girls there love me and love being coached by me. Um, they get excited to see me again. And just those little things make you feel good about yourself again. And so it's nice to be in an environment where you are valued again and that I have a skill that I can share and, you know, hopefully give some these girls some skill or just keep them active because like they're just there to stay fit and have fun with their friends and if I can facilitate that perfect like they're not going down the elite sport route but you know sport kept me out of a lot of trouble as a teenager and so I'm hoping that does for them too um and it's just nice to be back with them like I've coached these girls since they were little tiny tots and they're actually in year 11 and 12 now because I haven't coached them in a year over a year and I was just baffled so it's nice to do that again um and then I'm looking for some more PT work um strength and training um because I'd like to get more experience in that zone and like I said before how that mishmash between the physical and mental um in the future I'd like to give back to sport that way um and develop my own program to help athletes be able to better um you know move and work within their body but also focus and deal with stress and pressure and how that looks in the future I don't know um but that's my long-term goal but probably not in elite sport because elite sport is just it's just crazy it's, it's really tough um so I'd, I'd like to say working with the developing athletes where you see a lot of growth and you see what effect you can have on these young people's life as as people but as also as athletes and I think that is really rewarding um and that's what I love about gymnastics coaching and so I'm hoping that will transition into a role like that in the future and then to close this off give me five words or phrases mm -hmm. that you use to define that you use to define yourself now like who is Maddie right now five words and phrases um she is resilient i'm still going to use the word strong <laughs> i'm still going to use the word athlete still very much in my identity um she is outgoing and I want to say maybe like fierce. I don't those know, are, a bit of a diva. Yeah, I just don't want to, I don't want to care so much about what people think or be nice to people that aren't nice to me anymore. I don't have to deal with that. I just want to hang around with people that I like, do what I want and be happy within myself. So a bit of diva in there too, a bit fierce, a bit diva, but yeah. <laughs> I love, I love that combination of words. That was great. Do you think you'll ever stop identifying as an athlete? No. <laughs> and that's perfectly fine. I don't think so. Yeah. I think it will just become a smaller part of me. But yeah, it's, it's been a lot of me. And then it, because I want to stay working in the athletic world, I think it's always going to be there and really on the surface. And it's played a lot into what I want to do in the future and you know getting support from different people I've realized what important role these people play and I want to do that to others as well so um yeah I think it's shaped a lot of me good and bad 
And then is there anything else that you think that I missed about telling your story? Anything that you want to make sure that we got in that we have not? Any, this is normally the time the interview where I say if there are any causes that you want to support, any links to things that you would like me to put in the show notes, the floor mm -hmm. is yours. Um, I mean, I guess- if there's the not, thing, that's fine too. Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing for me would be that I want to see change in sport. Um, my experience with mental health in sport is poor um, through developing mental illness, but also the support I received during it and then being kicked to the curb. And I think that we need to change the way we treat athletes um, by getting better education and awareness for the support staff around us and even having support staff that can help us in this area, which is just a missing void in my experience with it anyways. Um, and then that cultural shift um, where we're not just a business transaction that are an in and out thing where if they see that you're injured or you're hurt or you're not strong enough or mentally strong, you're kicked to the curb. And um, that, I do not agree with at all. And I've seen happen way too many times and happen to myself. And I just don't think we can do that to people. Um, we have to remember that we are still humans and that we need to be treated like that and that we will struggle. And the importance of a program is not just to see success at the highest level, but also to lift those people up when, when they're not doing well. And that's gonna change from a cultural shift and being able to have the support and the services around. So that would be my biggest thing that I want change. And my reason for speaking about this is because I don't want any athlete to be treated the way I was treated. Absolutely. Thank you so much for talking to me today. Let yeah, sorry, me... I've gone over time a little bit for you. <laughs> uh, I, so I, I schedule out hour and a half increments just because okay. some of them are done in 45 minutes. Some of them take an hour and 20. It's okay. just, it totally depends. So yeah, I'm good fine. at talking. <laughs> <I find. laughs> Let me just see when your episode will come out. So the plan is for yours um, March 30th. Okay. Will be the story of you. Perfect. And if, I mean, you have more than the month, but if you can just send me a picture of you that you would like for social media. I know that mm -hmm. you also requested that you, you listen to it ahead of time. I can send that to you once it's done. And I don't think I said anything bad, but sometimes I'm a little negative towards the the higher powers, and I'm like, oh, that probably shouldn't go out. <laughs> well, the, the great thing about what I do on this podcast is if if we get to the end of the interview and you said anything that you want to take back or you want edited yeah. out, I am always like, yeah, it doesn't really. I can I just click delete. Yeah. No, I don't think there was anything that I got a little carried away with. <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. So a picture of you and we will reconvene in a month. <laughs> cool. Would you rather a skiing picture or um, one in just. I, I normally say either a headshot or a picture of you in action. It doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Just right. one that I can use for for the social media that I put out. OK, cool. And if there's anything that happens between now and March 30th that you would like included, just okay. send me a DM and I can put it in the script. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. And yeah, thank have a good time. rest of your day. Thanks for yeah. getting up with me. <laughs> of course, of course. Nice Bye. to see you.